May I now invite Kanish Tharoor, Annie Zaidi, and K. Srilata to take their seats on stage, please. And the session is called The Artful Tales. Uh, it's a pleasure indeed to welcome Annie Zaidi, Kanish Tharoor. Uh, I'll just very briefly introduce them to you, and uh, then we'll have a conversation. Annie Zaidi writes fiction, non-fiction poetry, and scripts. She is the editor of Unbound, 2,000 Years of Indian Women's Writing, and the author of Gulab, as well as Love Stories, number 1 to 14, and Known Turf. Kanish Tharoor is the author of Swimmer Among the Stars, a collection of short stories. His journalism and criticism have appeared in international and Indian publications. So, uh, over to them. Um, I think it was Walter Benjamin who, in his essay, The Storyteller, uh, remarked that we have lost the ability to exchange experiences. And the art of storytelling, he says, is actually coming to an end because experience itself has fallen in value. Uh, and yet, as human beings, we've always felt the need to tell stories, to sort of frame the chaos, the randomness of our lives within uh, the framework of a, of a story. In a sense, it's like, uh, perhaps like shaping life, much as a potter would shape clay. And traces of uh, the storyteller cling to the story just the way the handprints of the potter cling to the clay vessel. So within the larger tradition of tales, uh, where do you think short stories stand? They are, in a sense, like sla snapshots of life, slice of life, uh, unlike a novel, perhaps. Um, so I would like both of you to respond to this question. Why do you like working with this form? And what, according to you, are the strengths, perhaps the limitations of this particular genre? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, is my mic on? Uh, can you hear me? Is my, wi is my mic on? Uh, well, so first of all, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be back at the Hindu Pavilion. <laughs> and um, no, it's, it's a pleasure also to be in the company of such great writers. Uh, I'd like to say, first of all, that you know, for me, the short story isn't the sole form I'd like to write in. I'm also simultaneously writing a novel. But I really did enjoy writing these short stories. And you know, it's uh, unlike the novel, a prose narrative segmented in shorter sections is something that we've been doing for thousands of years. Uh, the novel is a slightly more recent invention than that. And I think, you know, at least in the, in the terms of my collection, uh, one of my interests and one of my tendencies was to inhabit, I, mean, I don't want to pretend to Walter Benjamin and that kind of rarefied critical theory, but to inhabit the voice of an older kind of storyteller. Um, and I do think that's more easy, it's easier to do in a, in, a, in a collection of short stories than to do uh, over the course of a very long novel. Um, one of the other, the other advantages I found with uh, writing short stories is that my conceits tend to be a little bit adventurous, a little bit far-flung. Uh, I have a short story about diplomats trapped in a near-space orbit or about an elephant, an Indian elephant having to journey between two Moroccan cities. Um, and you know, as a young writer playing with these stories, uh, it can be just at, the, at a very fundamental level easier to sustain these kinds of conceits and, and, and premises over the course of a short story than uh, over the course of a, of a novel. Um, but I'd be interested to hear uh, Annie's version of that question. Um, well, I am, I think the. I do work across several forms and formats. Uh, my training uh, is in journalism, so I, uh, a lot of my work is nonfiction as well. So when I write fiction, um, one of the reasons I choose short stories is that I can see an end to it. I am not a big plotter. I, I, I don't start writing a story already knowing where it is going. I don't know what my characters are going to do. Um, so all I have is an image or a character and I am curious to see where this person or this story might go. And in a short story, I think, I sort of think I know that I can handle this, that this character will go up to wherever this character wants to go and when this character wants to stop, I can stop. And I think 
the short story as a form allows me to do that. Uh, if I undertook a novel, if I already knew that I am undertaking a novel, I think I would just be a little frightened of not knowing, the lack of knowing. A short story allows me to not know and gives me a certain freedom. Yeah, I, I, if I may echo that, I, I find that when I'm writing, I do my best thinking as I write. Um, and so approaching, uh, uh, approaching something with a sort of methodical plan is not how my writing works. Um, and again, a short story allows you that freedom to take little twists and turns um, that I think sometimes, depending on the kind of novel you might be writing, you need a larger structure in advance you know, to work into. Otherwise, you will find what uh, Annie, Annie suggests of this sort of voluble, amorphous, impossible to grapple with uh, uh, infinite space ahead of you. But it also comes from very real fear. I have written a hundred thousand words and had to toss all of it out of the window just because it wasn't working. I, I didn't know where I was going and when I finished writing it, I sat back and said, this is not going anywhere at all. Um, and and that's, that's the truth. It, you give it a year almost of your life and with a novel, it's a very risky thing to do, to yeah. set Absolutely. out and not yeah. know where you're going. Absolutely, I think uh, that's, that's right. The sheer waste, uh, amount of things you might have to waste is just uh, very frightening to think about. Uh, there's a novel waiting in the wings. I think you're currently working on a novel. Could you perhaps speak a little bit about that? I don't particularly want to talk about it too much until I, until I finish it. Um, it is, it's historical. It's set in the 15th century, like much of my writing. Uh, but it's not set in India. It's set in, in and around the Mediterranean. But I don't particularly want to say more than that at the moment. Okay, so um, I'm wondering if you would uh, both care to read uh, an excerpt Perhaps uh, Annie could uh, go first. I really loved your uh, collection of love stories, numbers 1 to 14. And the first, the opening story, uh, where you have this uh, sort of woman who's approaching retirement and she's thinking of it with great dread because uh, she's actually fallen in love with this um, announcer who makes these announcements in the railway station. And she's, she's worried that she's never going to be able to hear him again. So if I may invite you to read from that story. Um. Yeah, so as Srilata says, this is a story of a woman who falls in love with an announcer's voice. It's called Love Story Number 10, aka the one that was announced. Um, I'm going to read a passage from the m middle of the story. What's happened at this point in the story is that she's just heard the voice and I'm going to read out the description of how and why she falls in love with this voice. She couldn't explain why he was so special. Maybe the way he read out the delayed schedule that first time, foolishly, foolishly racing through the whole announcement, then repeating it in three languages, Marathi, Hindi, English. His English was heavily accented with Marathi. And on days when he was going to announce a cancellation, his voice sometimes cracked with sheer nervousness. Passengers, kindly pay attention. Passengers, she could picture a young man, not yet confident in his own skin. Someone who wore gray pants and mixed cotton shirts, blues and whites to work. His eyes might be large, and if he wore glasses, they would look even larger. He probably blinked when he got nervous. And he probably had to write down the announcement in his own handwriting before he approached the microphone. That was what he sounded like, and her heart went out to the nervous young man. Over the years, she got better at picking up voices. She began to pay close attention. There were usually three women announcers on her route, and the man who sounded older, more gruff. Then there was him his voice utterly unsuited to the making of public announcement. Did they make him announce things just to hear him sound foolish? Did they laugh at him? She could imagine that. Colleagues were like school children, so innocently cruel. That was why she never spoke about him to her own colleagues. One would tell the other, and then there would be no stopping them. Meanwhile, the announcements grew more frequent. Somebody would announce the name of the upcoming station, then the name of the next station. This was when she developed an instinct. The announcement system would bristle, 
crackle, the microphone would be switched off and on again, and exactly two seconds before the voice began to speak, she would venture a guess. Would it be him or not? Nine times out of ten, she was right. It delighted her. It made her flush. This ability to pick him out, pluck him out of the radio silence, she whispered a name she didn't even know and thought, there you are. I knew it was you. It was like the game she had played as a child. Someone would sneak up behind you and put their palms on your eyes. Then you had to guess who it was. Sometimes you used tricks, rings, wristbands, scars. Nail length would lend clues or smell, even body temperature. Still, you mostly counted on your instinct. She remembered the thrill of being right and also her longing to be known, to be guessed at, when she put her hands over a chosen friend's eyes and the friend somehow guessed correctly, she would feel fulfilled, redeemed, whole. If a friend guessed you right again and again, it meant there was a special bond. And here she was, getting it right almost every time. It meant something, didn't it? Thrilled. She resolved to take the 822 every day. That was the train on which she heard his voice most often. I'll stop there. And Kanish, if I may invite you to read from your uh, title story, Swim Among the Stars, which I, if I may say so, uh, I found personally, intellectually the most uh, exciting of all your stories, revolving as it does around the idea of the last speaker of a language and the ethnographers who try to record that. Thank you. That was really lovely, Annie. Uh, so this story is uh, is the title story of the collection. It's um, it comes out of my interest, which is I've had this interest for a little while, in the plight of endangered languages around the world. We live in a moment when, unlike any other pre previous period in history, where linguistic diversity is really diminishing all over the world. Uh, and what's interesting is, I mean, you know, I, I, this is not an entirely abstract uh, subject for me. What's emerged in the last few years is that New York City, where I live, is one of the world's greatest repositories of endangered languages. Because it turns out that so many of the languages, um, many languages that have disappeared in places like Indonesia or Bangladesh or uh, Belize and so forth, are still spoken by diasporic communities in New York. So there are many ethnographers and researchers who are busy about the city recording the last, uh, the last syllables of languages that are no longer spoken where they came from. Um, so this story came out of that interest of mine. Uh, and uh, the title, Swimmer Among the Stars, which I'm not going to get to in the process of my reading, but it refers to uh, the, my main character, the last speaker of this language, trying to find terminology in her own language uh, to, 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 to deal with new ideas. And Swimmer Among the Stars is her way of describing the word astronaut in her language. But I'll read from the beginning. As a rule, the last speaker of a language no longer uses it. Ethnographers show up at the door with digital recorders, ready to archive every declension, each instance of the genitive, the idiosyncratic function of verbal suffixes. But this display hardly counts as normal speech. It simply confirms reality to the last speaker, that the old world of her mind is cut adrift from humans and can only be pulped into a computer. She finds it strange to listen to the sounds of her mouth. Inevitably, she mingles a more common language with her own. That common language, after all, is the speech that now keeps her company, that leads her through the market that sits with her in the evenings by the television, that gives her the terminal diagnosis at the clinic, that pours through her letterbox, that comes in a crisp nurse's outfit to wash her feet. Her own language does nothing of the sort. It is nowhere to be found. She pauses, silent now, staring incredulously at the microphone. How am I the last speaker of my language? How can I be its keeper? My language left me. She apologizes to the ethnographers. You must understand, she says, that though my memory is preserved better than a lemon, it is still difficult to remember which words are my own and which words are not. 
please speak as it comes naturally to you, the ethnographers say. Thank you, I will try. In any case, we can help you remember. This last speaker looks up, puzzled. But if you know already, then why do you want to hear it from me? It means more if it comes from you. Do you speak my language then? Do you understand me when I say this, when I say that? And even now, when I am singing that, that this song that my father sang every day as he disappeared down the valley. She sings and her alien words crackle about the room. No, we do not understand, the ethnographers say. Or if we do, it is only distantly, as if we were reading shapes in a rain cloud. Oh, that is a shame. It would be nice to sing that song for you, for someone. Please, madam, sing it for the microphone. She grins. So the microphone understands, does it? Yes, it understands. If only you could get microphones to talk, she laughs and then feels a little sorry for herself. She does not mean to sound sardonic. No one could accuse her of being indifferent to her plight. Some years before, it had occurred to her that she was no longer in the habit of hearing her own tongue. Everybody in the town seemed to be speaking the common language. She did not mind using their language, since she had dwelled in it for, all, for a long time, almost as long as she could remember, and had kept it clean and given it a good airing, rearranged the furniture so it suited her just right. It was the language of her husband and her children, and she had made it hers. But always, in the darker corners, she placed mementos of her own, a proverb, a snatch of rhyme, some light daily expressions, the glimpse of which would startle her family. With nobody, to, with nobody to speak her language to, she began talking with objects, the pots and pans, a creaking door, the sharp corner of a table. She never spoke it with animals, and here a foreign kind of pride sparked within her. It was never a language to waste on goats. Once, on a rare visit, her son came upon her in the living room, speaking in tongues with a teacup. He told her she was going mad. No, she sighed, you don't understand. This is what a conversation sounds like. Would you like a cup of tea, the last speaker asks. And then I'll, oh, sorry. Would you like, like a cup of tea, the last speaker asks, the ethnographers. They would. Let's have some tea and then I'll sing for you. She rises from her seat and waits as they shift their equipment, the light stand and camera, the microphones, the attendant knots of wires. Brushing away their offers to assist her, she lights the stove with a match and stares out through the kitchen window. Poplars nod in the breeze over the mustard field. Someone's boy is loitering at the front gate, his hands in the pockets of his jeans. At each half step, his sneakers light up red. She thinks he must be here to look at the visitors, but she is wrong. He follows her movements with open and unblinking curiosity, as if there was something surprising about the way a kettle boils. She smiles. That's the matter with strange guests. They turn you into a stranger as well. The tea warms her voice. When she sings, her eyes close and her chin, with its gentle down of hair, thrusts forward into the lamplight. The ethnographers cannot help but admire her strong set of teeth, a rare sight in so much of their fieldwork. They are used to thinking that there is half a relationship between dental health and endangered languages. Languages, like people, become toothless. In her case, of course, a full mouth of teeth won't make any difference. She is the last, the very last. After her, the language has only a ghostly future. Its memory will haunt scholars and graduate students. Nobody misses it in the places where it was once spoken. Few even remember the time when its clambering rhythms united the valley and the uplands. Clinically speaking, it is already dead. A language cannot be alive if it exists alone in the mind of an old woman, no matter how fine her teeth. I'll stop there. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Kanish. Um, if I uh, may ask you this, how did you dream of your stories and also, of course, of the entire collection before it was created, and to and did you live up to your expectations? Um, with this particular collection of stories, I kind of, uh, for me, it was a kind of blind groping, really, because I would often just start working off an image. Um, 
the stories, as you can see here, are numbered. Uh, I started, the first story I wrote in this collection was number one. I didn't even have a title. I didn't, none of my characters had any names. I just had a kind of image in my head. And I wanted to see what it would become if I just pushed that image into a story. And uh, with every other story that followed, I followed the same thing. I would latch on to one image, a single image, and keep drawing that out and see where it went. Um, so really, there was no motivation beyond that. It would be one compelling image that I was curious about. But with other stories, sometimes it is uh, an idea that I'm very consciously trying to. There's, for instance, there's this one story I've written um, that was published in um, Caravan magazine uh, last year. It's called uh, Registered Post. It was coming off from the idea of registered letters. Um, which were, you know, nowadays everything comes via courier mostly. But the idea of the registered post was a guarantee, you know, that it, this is a letter that somebody is saying will very definitely reach. And um, I was also in the story, it's a love story again, it's, it's thwarted love story, it's, it's a story about um, a couple that is forced apart because they're from different religions and different communities. So the idea of the whole story really is about the idea of the cost of love. I wanted to explore that thought that if somebody has thwarted your love, if somebody has taken your love away from you, um, what have they taken from you really? I mean, what, what is the price of that love? And if you spent say 10 years away from someone and you haven't fallen out of love in them, if you still love that person, then what is the cost attached to that love? Um, I was using the device then of the postal system because um, if a post, if the postal system loses a letter, um, they are not legally liable except if it can be proved that they have deliberately lost your letter, that they have deliberately prevented the letter from reaching its destination. And with the registered post, uh, I could do that. So then that was my motivation. I took these two ideas, the idea of the cost of love and the idea of the, legal of the postal system being legally responsible for the loss of a particular document or package and married these two ideas together. And that was kind of what led to it. So sometimes it's a concept and sometimes it's you kind of consciously say that, okay, I want to tackle this idea and then you go at that. Yeah, I would, I would broadly agree with that. I, um, I often work from a line that comes to me or an image that comes to me. And then when I sit down to write the story, the work of the story is explaining, uh, explaining and justifying that line or justifying that image. Um, there are a few stories in the collection that were sort of more methodically planned out. Uh, I have uh, my, the last story or sequence in the collection is, about, is a retelling of... Um, the Persian medieval narrative about Alexander the Great. And that required a lot of research and a lot of reading uh, various translations. And so that was slightly more mapped out and planned. But many of my other stories uh, sprang from ideas that came to me while doing reading, reading the news. Uh, I have a story that's about uh, an icebreaker that gets uh, full of a team of scientists that gets stuck in the Antarctic. And that's based on a, on a real life event that really struck me when I came across it. Um, I have another story that is about, I, I think I mentioned this before, about diplomats in, in near Earth orbit. And that came to me after I read a newspaper account of Lib the Libya, how the Libyan parliament had been condemned to meet in a Greek car ferry in the Mediterranean because the country itself was too unsafe for them to conduct the, the business of ruling the country. Um, so I sort of took that to its logical extreme and came up with this story. Uh, so, I mean, for me, it's, it's, I didn't sit down to write uh, a collection in one go. These stories were compiled over a period of about 10 years, mostly in the last five years. And they very much spring from, from, from moments of inspiration uh, that came, where, you know, it could have come in my sleep, that came while reading, while reading news on the internet, while reading books. Um, and I think that's one of the joys of short stories, that you can really reach in so many different directions and, and incorporate those ideas in a collection like this. 
Read like mad, cut like crazy, treat even your minor characters with respect. These are uh, Sarah Waters' rules, I think, for um, writing. What are some of yours? Um, rules for writing, okay. Um, well, one of the things that I am, I think I still struggle with it and I have to remind myself to kind of, you know, kick myself every once in a while, but one of the things is that, is there a story here to tell? Sometimes you start to tell a story because you are compelled by your own image or your own sentences. You write this great sentence and you think, oh, I think that I can push this into a story. And you go on and on and on. And sometimes somewhere through, you, you kind of lose steam. You know, sometimes you, um, if you're losing steam, to be actually be able to give up, to step away from it and say that, uh, this is possibly not a story, this is possibly not good enough, this is possibly, uh, you know, just, just to kind of not, not grow too attached to my own work. That is my first rule. And the second rule is I actually do try at least. I, I don't always succeed, but I think it was Mark Twain or somebody had said that if you see an adjective somewhere, stamp on it and kill it or something like that. So I do try and avoid a adjectives and sometimes adverbs too, but adverbs I don't always succeed, adjectives I do kind of mostly succeed. And um, the third rule is that um, don't, don't try to tell stories for effect. I think with short stories that is a great temptation. Sometimes you see something say in a newspaper and it really catches your eye and, and because it has had an impact on you, uh, you think that this might be an impactful story. And I have to watch out against that because if I don't feel an emotional connect with it, then if I feel only a kind of, uh, say, a social or an intellectual connect, but not an emotional connect with it, then I try. I, I think it would be wasted work, at least for the kind of writer I am, that I think it would be wasted work. So I try to stay away from that. I have to uh, I have to watch out for adverbs because I'm I have a bad habit of using too many so that's that's what I stamp on when I when I go over my writing uh, beyond that I have to confess I don't have too many hard and fast rules um, I I really you know when I write my stories and as I'm working on my novel I try to try to stay true to the to to what motivated me to write these stories in the first place um, and I trust my instincts. I think a lot of people can end up second guessing themselves, be you know, be disillusioned, be worried about how their story will be received or what want their story to conform to others' expectations of stories. Um, I try to shut that out and stay true to my instincts and stay true to what motivated me and what interested me in the subject I was writing about uh, as I'm as I'm writing the story. I'm wondering what is it about the business of being uh, writers? that drives you guys round the bend? And the opposite question, what is it uh, about storytelling that you find most compelling, most rewarding? I find, um, sorry. I find uh, that one of the difficult things about being a writer and you know, spending most of my time writing my fiction is that <laughs> it means that at no point, and this is a very logistical problem, but at no point do you really feel uh, free to do any other work apart from your writing. There is a sense of eternal pressure put upon you that any moment can be spent furthering you know, your craft. It could be spent reading, uh, it could be spent refining something you've already written. Uh, I sh that, that, that to me is a struggle because as a writer you don't have a, you don't, I, d I don't have a clear sense of a nine to five, an easy distinction between the time that I'm working and the time that I'm free to do whatever I want to do. You don't have a life in short. <laughs> your well, the problem, the job problem is I don't write as much as I should in order to have a life. Um, but, um, but, but, you know, the joy of writing, and I, you know, I write nonfiction as well, I do, I'm a journalist as well, um, but, you know, for me there's no greater satisfaction than finishing a short story, hope, inshallah one day finishing a novel. Uh, that sense of fulfillment you get when you realize that, okay, I think this is done, I don't have to tinker with this anymore, that's a great feeling. Um, and you know, it's 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 the thing. I think it's you know, it's the writing is the thing that I'm best at. So I 
I, I have to do. I think the thing that really does bother me the most is uh, time discipline. Um, I, I find that it is entirely possible because as a writer, I am, um, I have, I, I, I do have, um, I don't have any kind of uh, writing discipline really. In, in, I don't I don't have any particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are no obligations. You don't have to necessarily deliver if you don't set deadlines for yourself. And perhaps some of this comes from my journalism training. I'm very deadline driven. Uh, if you tell me deliver a story by the end of this month, I will, there's a 99.99 .99 chance that I will deliver something. But if you tell me deliver something next year, you know, I don't know really because next year is too far away. And, and I think that that becomes, sometimes my energies just seem to be frittered away at there's so much to read, there's so much to talk about that sometimes it's entirely possible a whole day has gone by and you've not gotten anything achieved that you can say, you can point to and say that I did this today and, and that really sometimes bothers me. Um, the thing I like most is that I am completely, um, you know, in, in, in Hindustani, in Urdu, there is this concept of dui, uh, duality, that, um, you know, there is duality of different kinds. And I think that with writing, one of the things that the duality goes away for a little while, that for a while I feel completely at one with myself and I'm completely into the writing. And it's not even necessarily pleasure. Sometimes it could be grief, sometimes it could be whatever, but what I am thinking, what I'm feeling, and what I'm writing, for a minute, all of it condenses. I become uh, a person who is completely attuned, in tune with herself, and I think that is what I like most about writing. Have you ever uh, sort of thought to yourself, uh, yourselves, uh, how I wish I could write like that person, X, Y, Z? Who are those people or who's that person? I'll let Kanishka answer that. No, have you ever thought to yourself how I wish I could write like that person, particular writer? And, uh, you know, who would that be? I, th I think the, the answer to this question changes. Uh, sorry, it's a new mic. Can you hear me? Uh, the answer to this question changes from time to time. Uh, right now, I think I wish I could write like Wyszard Kapuscinski, the Polish journalist from the Soviet era. Uh, whose books, even though they're ostensibly non-fiction, have been inspirations for my fiction as well. Um, there's, something, there's something really startling about what he manages to achieve with fairly economic, uh, flat-level prose, but just the way he conjures the, the worlds and the stories he has to tell is so unbelievably lyrical um, uh, that I, I find I'm always just blown away uh, reading him in a way that I don't think many authors of fiction can captivate me. Uh, what for you have been uh, some of the, you know, the richest sources of writing material? You spoke about it briefly, but uh, in terms of uh, sources for writing material, what do you tend to draw upon the most? I think mostly what I see. I, I'm very driven by what I see. Um, more than what I hear or read about. I'm, uh, I think that, like in almost all these stories, it, it was an image that I saw um, or a conversation sparked off by, you know, something that, uh, something like that. Um, or sometimes experience, of course. It's some, some of it is experience, but some of it is also. Sometimes it's something very random, like um, in one of the stories, um, the last story in this one, 14, uh, it's about a young couple that meet on a bus, on a bus that's going up in the hills, and um, how they meet and start talking is that the girl steals the boy's shoes. Um, that comes from my brother's shoes once got stolen in a train. Uh, they were new shoes, it's nice shoes. And he went to sleep with his shoes still. If you've noticed, lots of you must have noticed that 
people who travel in trains, they often sleep with their shoes under their head because they might get stolen. So it's things like that, really, things that have happened to someone I know or things that I've seen around the city. I think I'm slightly the opposite. I, um, I do really like living in my imagination. And so the sources of inspiration for me tend to be things that I have read, things that I have heard of, stories I've heard from elsewhere. Obviously, in these, in these collection, this, this my, in my collection, there are plenty of moments of my personal experience that have slipped into these stories. But my principal motivation uh, tends to be, tends to lie in the world outside of me. Um, I haven't yet found myself in my life a particularly uh, rich source for fiction. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm too, I'm very, very interested in the world outside of me and mining that for, uh, for, the, for the work I'm doing. May I now invite both of you to read another brief excerpt from your, uh, anything of your choice, uh, any of your short, short stories. Um, I'll read from the, the last section of my book, which, as I said before, is a rewriting of something called the Skandarnama. Um, this is a cycle of stories that spread originally in Greek and then Armenian and then into other languages uh, from the 4th century AD onwards right down to the present um, that tell fantastical tales about Alexander the Great. Uh, so I. And I've always been captivated by this cycle. It's a kind of global literature before global literature. Um, and so I have a series of short, short vignettes that are based on actual episodes from the literary tradition of the, the Alexander romance in this case. And one of the sources I used a lot was the Persian medieval Iskandarnama. So this is from the, 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 this is the first episode in the sequence. And it's based on a wonderful, on, you know, on a wonderful uh, story that's been disseminated in languages as diverse as Oguz, Turkic, and Malay. The Duel of the Artists. Along with the rest of his entourage, Iskander, Iskander is Alexander, Iskander came to China with artists. They were practiced in all the styles of his lands, in the big cheeks of Rum, in the dusty eyebrows of the Persians, in the grain of Mesopotamia, in the delighted paunches of the Indians. The Khan of China welcomed the great conqueror and his retinue. As usual, there was much feasting and drinking, belching and puking. For the first time in his life, Iskander tried the famous Chinese numbing pepper and felt his tongue disappear. This is extraordinary, he said. What an amazing taste. The Khan nodded. Is it true, the Khan asked, that your mother had such bad breath, your father had to return her? Steam rose from the platters of meat. Acrobats tumbled between the tables. That's the story, Iskander said, replied. I wouldn't know. No breath smells bad to me if its words are fair. The next day, Iskander called for a competition. Let us see which people are superior, he said to the Khan. He set the terms of a wager. If the Chinese won out, then he would return west and leave the Khan and his property unmolested. If my people prove the stronger, Iskander said, well, you can imagine what will happen next. The tournament began. First, the javelin throwers sent spears whistling into the sky. Then the archers tested their precision, aiming for a glass cup, the fruit on a tree, the moving tail of a bullock. Wrestlers slapped their shoulders and rubbed their chests with soil. Sprinters became shadows on the steps. Iskander inspected the proceedings with a falcon latched to his wrist. In all these feats, the Chinese were equal to his men. Nothing could separate the talents of the musicians either, nor the dancers. Philosophers got entangled in the logic of the other. The astrologers compared their catalogues of stars and planets and found that while they might see different forms in the sky, the substance was much the same. The calligraphers fell in love with each other's penmanship and went to sleep dreaming in alien lines. Finally, it was the turn of the artists. They were brought to a large rock cave. A curtain was placed in the middle, cutting the cave in half. They were given three days to compose a masterpiece. At the end of the three days, the curtain would be drawn and the artwork compared. Iskander's artists spent the first day preparing their paints. On the second day, they turned the rock face into a sprawling, courtly scene. 
First, they painted the landscape in the background, mountains and waterfalls swaying in the torchlight. Then they drew animals and peasants beyond the walls of the city. Next came the rings of the city itself, its assemblies of merchants and soldiers, courtesans, vegetable sellers, butchers and drovers. Then the marble pavilions of their court, their filigree and gold gleam. At the top of the court, lording above the entire scene, sat the turbaned form of Iskander, back erect, placid-faced, watching as the Khan bent over and rolled a set of dice. Iskander's artist spent the third day <coughs> painting the hair, eyebrows, mustaches, and sideburns of every figure in their mural. At the end, they placed eyelashes on the goats and deer. When Iskander entered the cave, he laughed with pleasure at the sight of the mural. Nothing could surpass this accomplishment. No Chinese artist could match the deafness of color and movement in the fall of each bit of clothing, or the pathos in each downturned gaze, nor the wonder of painting rock upon real rock, imbuing the stone with magical life. Iskander called out to the Khan, draw the curtain, he said, and you'll see the end of your kingdom. The curtain was drawn, torchlight filled the cave. Iskander couldn't believe it. The Chinese had painted the exact same mural as his artists. There were all the animals and men, walls and mountains, domes and minarets. He came closer and watched the Chinese murals sway and tremble, saw his shadow interrupt the painting. It was a reflection. The Chinese artists had shaved and polished the wall to such a fine degree that the rock assumed the quality of a mirror. While your men were busy picking colors and sketching shapes, the Khan said, mine transformed the cave itself. The Khan ordered the curtain to be pulled forward. Iskander watched the mural vanish from the wall. Naked stone stretched before him, alive with its own dark light. He stayed with the Khan for another week. Afterwards, reprovisioned and laden with gifts, Iskander and his entourage returned home. Okay, so this story is called The One That Was Fulfilled. I'm going to read a short section from this one. Um, I like to read this section because this is a fight scene, really. It's, it's, an, it's a fight between a husband and wife. Uh, the marriage is sort of falling apart. Um, and what has happened in the story up until this point is that the wife has left the husband, um, saying that, you know, that the marriage is not working out, that, you know, the house is sort of, it's, it's rotting really from the inside. And, um, and after that, after leaving, she has come back to him. So this is at that point where she's come back and he doesn't know what to do now because, you know, should he stick with her or should he not? When he returned from his walk, the wife was in bed, stirring slightly. He stepped into the bedroom to get a fresh pair of clothes and went to take a shower. When he emerged, he didn't ask if his wife wanted some tea like he used to in the old days. He made a strong cup of tea for himself and sat in the kitchen to read the newspaper. The maid arrived. Another cup of tea was made for the wife. The child was fed. Breakfast was set on the table. The child was bathed and taken away to school. The wife had finished dressing. She came to the dining table and took the chair opposite, folding her hands as if waiting for an explanation. He turned a page. Finally, the wife took his name. He lowered the newspaper. What is wrong, the wife asked. He shrugged. You have to talk to me, she said. Since last night, suddenly you've been behaving like, I don't know, like I don't exist. I thought things were going to be better in our home. His mouth stretched into a mirthless smile. He hadn't planned on saying it, but the words stumbled out of his mouth. Home. I thought this home was a dead relic. Dead things don't get better. They rot. The wife clenched her fists. A quaver crept into her voice. I don't understand you. Forget about me. 
What about you? What about me? What do you want? Respect to start with. When have I ever treated you with disrespect? You never respected me, you just respect your friends and industry colleagues, not me. That is not true. It is not fair to accuse me of that. It wasn't fair on me to be reduced to something lying around the house, a woman who nurses the baby and supervises the servants. Oh, please, yes, I was just someone you hired to run the house so you could be left free to create, to become this famous rich person. You tell me, was that all you were? I felt like it. I can't control how you feel. I didn't know how you felt. How come you notice details about the world, about cities and railway stations and music and landscapes, but you don't know how your own wife feels? For God's sake, I didn't marry cities and landscapes. So marriage means a license to stop caring. Are you seriously suggesting that I didn't care for you? Well, I didn't feel cared for. Then why did you stick around all this time? Oh, of course, now that is my fault too. Yes, it is, because you never said a word about what I was doing wrong. Did I not say I want to do my own thing? Well, then why didn't you? Who stopped you? You never supported me. I did everything I could for you. You weren't there, great. So now we're back to square one, me not being there. Yes, yes, because you had all the time in the world for others, for work, and I had nobody. Bullshit. I never even went out anywhere except for work. You had girls crawling all over the studios. No, there was never anyone else. You know that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I believe that. Even when you didn't let me touch you these last five months, I didn't go to another woman. So I'm supposed to be grateful. I'm just saying it because you brought it up. Do you expect me to have sex when I'm unhappy? No, I just expect a little honesty and consideration. You are such a self-absorbed, self-obsessed bastard. And what are you? A lazy, gold-digging bitch? He buried his head in his hands. The words were out of his mouth now. Let's stop there. Well, if you want to know the rest, you've got to buy the books. Uh, is there time for a very quick Q&A, maybe one or two questions? No, doubts. We may not have too much time. So okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, actually, it's my, it's my small analysis. I take one and a half minute. Uh, you're all very young. Until 18, you have not experienced much, you know? And poverty is the most intense and essential experience. And 18, you have boyfriend and girlfriend, and then you go to job. There's not much experience unless you are a literature student. You know, you have read, you have read something, and you have to read all the literature from 50 to 1940 to 60 through, throughout the world. You know, so they had, they produced intense, intense uh, literature. So if you so have now a question, please. Can yeah, we? and now it's become, it's becoming very watered down. You know, I'm asking how many books you sell, sir. How many books you sell? How, how many, many books do you sell? How many sell? people you have? You can't even pay one month rent Should from, ask from this Should publishers, office. perhaps. <laughs> no, it's, it's my analysis, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, okay, uh, there no is something uh, lacking, you know. I'm not blaming you, you know. Your potential experience is uh, very less. Thank you. Hi. I'm, just, I'm asking this question because of two things. One is with this advent of technology, we have, uh, you know, access to podcasts and uh, audio books. And second, that we're talking about short stories. So would you prefer your audience to hear the, hear the podcast or hear the audio books or read? And if yes, why? I mean, what would you prefer your audience to do? Read or hear the audio books? Uh, was your question directed at me? Was your question directed at me specifically? I have no idea how many books I've sold. My book isn't even officially out yet. It releases on January 27th. And, uh, and no, I, I, well, you know, I have to do other jobs to, to sustain myself as a writer, though I have sold my book in the UK and the US and in France and elsewhere, and that helps me a lot to make my life independent. Uh, if you want to know the logistics of my life, I resent a little bit the suggestion that age is any barrier to writing. You, you know, the... There are so many, there are so many writers going back millennia, going back millennia, who... There are so many writers going back millennia who wrote their first books, which are considered great books, uh, great poems, at ages half my age. So uh, the idea that your, your age, you need to have a certain uh, reservoir of experiences to write is nonsense in my mind. Uh, that might relate to if you're writing a particular kind of novel, a particular kind of emotional novel. Uh, I don't think my writing is attempting that, and I think the stories I've written in this collection 
um, stem out of real interests and real engagement with the world uh, and are entirely justified by that. Um, to respond to the question about uh, uh, podcast. I am very much a believer in the physical book. I don't have a Kindle. I never plan to have one. Uh, I listen to podcasts about football. Uh, I do not listen to podcasts about literature that often. So I, I fully hope that you will all read our books in the physical paper flesh. I will very quickly respond to both actually. Uh, about you, I also don't have a Kindle. I mostly read books uh, in physical format. But I do read a few ebooks as well, not that I have anything against them, just that I spend a lot of screen time in any case reading magazines and newspapers online, so I like to step away from the screen sometimes. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think whatever works for whoever at different points. Um, to respond to you, sir, although I do not think that you asked a very pointed question, I think you are confusing two or three very different things. One, I'm nowhere close to 18. Uh, two, if you look at literature, um, I think very great writers um, were dead before they even reached my age. If you look at, for instance, Akka Mahadevi was, you know, probably... Nobody knows Akka Mahadevi. We don't know, but we do know that she had perhaps started composing when she was still in her 20s, or even younger than that. And let me finish, do not interrupt now that you have asked, answer, uh, listen for my answer as well. Uh, Krishna Baldev Ved Steps in Darkness, for instance, is an account of a very young boy watching his mother and father fight brutally. All that experience probably came, it is the experience of before the age of 10. When you write it, at what point in your life is a different matter. Poverty can be experienced before the age of five, and you retain those memories. Any experience that you have at any point, up to 18, up to 28, up to 68, up to 88, is valid. It is the accumulated in experiences of a lifetime that sometimes go into a certain kind of book. But it would be absolutely not only uh, presumptuous, but also just false assumption that you need to live and that people do not have any kind of experience that is worth writing about as young people. Sometimes people have very brutal experiences before they are Anne Frank. She didn't even live to be 18. Uh, and the other thing you talked about, book sales, well, uh, I have now six books out. My first book was, my first book length book, the first was a very short collection of poems, but the first book length book uh, was a collection of essays that came out of my journalism and my reportage, of which uh, I don't know exactly how much money I have made, but I did sell uh, two editions, it went into a reprint within the first year of it. I sold everything, it's out of print now. Um, I don't think it is also a very fake, presumptuous and um, kind of unnecessary kind of argument that writers have to make enough money from the actual book sales. There are many writers in different languages. Well, so there are lots of absolutely brilliant writers who are maybe 80 years old and have written in various languages all over the world, just because they don't sell, is no argument for them writing or not writing. I mean, that is completely presumptuous. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I also just want to say, um, I, I want to insist on the, the value of fiction for fiction's sake. Um, I am not trying to write memoir. If I was, then I would agree that at the age, I'm 31, I'm not 18, um, that I, I wouldn't, I'm not aspiring to do that. And but I think that fiction has a virtue beyond the realm of day-to-day -day human experience and that we should stand up for it and it's something that people love and something I love um, and it's not necessarily governed by, by the experience, of the, the, by personal experience. Thank you. Great pleasure having you. I think the mic is not working. Take questions outside after this. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, panelists.